Welcome to another Striper Season Update brought to you by West Marine. With the recent new moon, the Big Bass in Chesapeake Bay are starting to move up the New Jersey ocean side. Big bass are also starting to show up in Long Island and Rhode Island. Cape Cod anglers are also starting to see better numbers of slot size fish with the occasional over slot size fish mixed in. Up and down the Striper Coast, there's no shortage of bait. So with this coming full moon, we're gonna see things bust wide open as the fish move out of their spawning grounds and push up the coast. Week one of Striper Cup wrapped up on Monday at 5 p.m. with James Tracy winning the shore division and taking home a pen surf casting combo. Rory flatly claimed the boat and kayak spot and took home a fully loaded Yeti bucket. Emma Tozer was our West Marine Youth Catch of the Week, and Michael Simonelli won the Costa Sunglasses Photo Contest. Week two is still open going into this weekend, and we have an excellent weather window to get out on the water. This week's prizes, for sure, we have the Pen Spin Fisher 6 combo. For the Boat and Kayak Division, we have the Yeti Loadout Go Box, and the West Marine Youth Catch of the Week prize is a West Marine gift card and a Zorus Lures prize pack. And as always, we have the Costa Sunglasses Photo Contest. The winner of that contest, which runs every week of Striper Cup, will get a free pair of Costa sunglasses. Before the upcoming full moon, anglers in New England can observe and fish worm hatches, which on the waters Jimmy Fee and Kevin Blinkoff discuss in this week's Striper Season Update. Hello, Kevin. Hey, Jimmy. How are you today? Good, good. So one of the things that happens every spring, uh, right around the time that the first schoolies hit New England, is you start hearing guys talk about worm hatches and it is a very popular kind of event i guess you'd call it among fly fishermen and light tackle fishermen in the back bays of long island rhode island cape cod and i know you've been out and have seen some of these worm hatches so first off i know it's a real pet peeve of yours when people call them worm hatches because that's not actually what's happening what is yeah. happening it comes from fly fishermen who think in terms of hatches. So when you're fishing a river for trout, a lot of times you have mayfly hatches, stonefly hatches, where these are actually insects that are kind of, you know, changing from being a larva and hatching out and it causes trout to feed. And so it's language from fly fishing. You think about hatches, you think about matching the hatch. So it's an event kind of like that where you're fishing in saltwater and all of a sudden these worms appear, uh, tons of them appear and Kind of like trout in a stream, when there's a worm hatch, you fish get very selective. They feed only on those worms, and they can be really tough to fool. But right, the reason we're saying it's not really a hatch, because that's not what's going on. These worms didn't hatch from an egg or something like that, but they did suddenly appear out of the bottom, and it's actually a spawning event. So not hatching, but actually a worm spawn event. But hey, I'm fine if you want to call it a hatch as well. So these tend to happen around this time of year they start in late april carry on through may i know in some places they'll go into june and there's a specific set of conditions when you're likely to find a worm hatch oh the, let's talk about the areas you're likely to find them first typically pretty a good distance up bays you know you're not going to get them too close to the open ocean and relatively shallow and muddy bottoms right yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on these worms on their biology, so I'll try not to get too scientific. But what's happening is these worms are spawning. They're waiting for the right condition. I believe there's different species, or at least maybe perhaps in different areas, you have different worms with different preferences in terms of when they happen, when these spawning events happen. So here on Cape Cod, we tend to see them um, early May tends to be a lot of them. I know in Rhode Island, there are major ones in salt ponds that start happening into June. And so what it tends to be is up inside estuaries, um, either far up in rivers, up in salt ponds, typically places with kind of a muddier, mucky bottom tends to be where these worms live. And they really seem to coincide with um, quick warm ups or temperature changes. So here on Cape Cod, early May, if you have a sunny, warm afternoon coupled with, say, a, a, a low tide that really lets that bottom warm up, lets the water warm up late afternoon, things get warm. That's when all of a sudden these worms pop out. And it also tends to be, you know, late afternoon into evening. Usually they kind of shut off and disappear as it starts to get dark, or at least they, they kind of taper off. Yeah. And they, you know, you spoke about how there are multiple species of worms that do this. They're part of uh, they're polychaetes, which means many legs. And if you've ever bought blood worms or sand worms at a tackle shop, that gives you a pretty good idea of what they look like. You know, they have those another name for them are bristle worms is what they seem to call them further south where it you know looks like an earthworm and then if you put like one line of of hairs down its side and th that's basically what makes it 
able to swim like that around the surface. Right. And what you what we were mentioning before, where it's not really a hatch, it's a spawn. Um, it's not the entire worm that you see when you see these worm hatches going on. So these, you know, we call them cinder worms. Those are the ones that we have up here on Cape Cod. And what you actually have is the reproductive sections of the worm leaving the worm. And they're kind of just, you know, if you see them moving around, you kind of get it. They're kind of just mindless reproducing sections of the worm that come up to the surface. And I mean, the, it, they, they look, they don't swim in any one particular direction. They, they zigzag, they, run they spiral, they mix around. And you see, sometimes you'll see these worm sections re releasing their, their gametes into the water. So there's some sort of spawning going on. It's weird. It's really weird. It's kind of gross and creepy, but it's also pretty cool to see. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it's wild to think about if you think about this as an organism that's sort of just, uh, you know, it's almost just throwing its <laughs> into the air and letting them do their thing um, up into the water, I guess. But uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let, not, let's I'm try and keep a straight face and be mature here. I'm not jealous of them. No. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but the majority of the worm does stay down there in the mud and they are a burrowing species. So most of the time they're spent, they're living under under the mud out of reach of these fish and, and you know they don't move very fast it would be easy pickings for you know predatory fish like striped bass weak fish you and i've been out there we've even seen river herring eating them just about everything everything that's around when these worm you know we're just gonna call them worm hatches just for the heck of it when they happen any fish that's in the backwaters there is going to take advantage of that that easy meal yeah. And like you mentioned, fish also, um, you know, birds will get in on it. Everything will eat these worms. And that's part of the strategy. You see it throughout nature. It's like an oak tree with acorns. Um, it's like when the cicadas come out every 17 years, overwhelm in numbers. So when one of these hatches or spawns happens, there's so many worm pits out there flying around that, you know, they're still going to be able, these, these fish can feast on them, animals can feast on them, but there's so many at one time it's overwhelming. They're going to have a successful spawn and they're going to reproduce and, and make more worms. So I'm, I can't get over the fact you said throw your <laughs> in the air. <laughs> so Kevin and I have been out there in the backwaters and it starts as just a couple worms and then you start seeing dozens and dozens of them and the fish come up in, in tremendous numbers and it does look so much like a hatch on a stream where you have trout rising. You're seeing they're not big, splashy, you know, feeds as you would see like if stripers were eating bait fish or, you know, blitzing on bunker. They just kind of come up to the surface and sip it, and it just leaves a little ring. And there could be, you know, a dozen to a hundred stripers feeding at a time, and you'd think it would just be gangbusters. Every cast, you're going to catch one. But it's kind of the opposite. That's part of, I think, what fishermen like about fishing these worm spawns or these worm hatches so much is that it's the excitement of knowing these fish are around, seeing them, and then the challenge of trying to fool them. And you really have kind of two different ways of, you know, two different schools of thought, and like, how are you going to catch a fish when they're when they really are just sort of lazily walk, you know, swimming around, sipping these worms, they've got as much to eat as they want. How are you going to convince them, hey, don't eat those worms, eat, eat my either imitation worm or something totally different? So that's what I was saying. There's really two different schools of thought. Either try and mimic the worms as best you can or go totally different and put something out there that these striped bass that are eating worms suddenly see, oh, you know, uh, a minnow or something else swims by your lure. And they're like, you know what, I'll take a break from eating these worms. I'll eat that instead. Um, something that'll get attention. It's similar to when you're fishing, you know, when there's anytime there's a ton of bait around and fish are keyed in on that bait, you either match the hatch or you try and stand out. Yeah. And the, they aren't difficult to, it's not difficult to tie a cinder worm fly. I mean, it's, it's pretty basic. You look at the shape, it is a red worm and then you, the either end is going to be black or brownish. And it, it takes a couple minutes to tie with either chenille or you could use feathers. There's a probably two dozen different worm patterns out there that people tie. I know you, you spin up some of your own as well. Yeah. And that's part of the fun of it is try and say, okay, this is the pattern that's going to do it. I'm going to make this thing look exactly like a worm. And when I get out in that worm hatch, I'm going to fool these fish when everybody else is standing around frustrated. But the, the, the fact of it is you can make a fly that looks just like a worm. I don't know anybody who can make a fly that swims like a worm. And we'll show some video of the way they move around. They'll go in a straight line. You'll see them leave like a V wake along the surface, and then all of a sudden spiral. Um, and there's no there's no fly retrieve, no way to strip a fly to make it move in circles and then suddenly take off in one direction. But um, 
So that's, yeah, your fly can look exactly like a worm. You're still going to be frustrated out there. So personally, um, I enjoy fishing these events for a little while, and then they tend to get pretty frustrating. And after I can't get a, a fish to be fooled by one of my flies, uh, usually I've had more success by doing something totally different, throwing on a streamer, um, or if I'm spin fishing, throwing a, a minnow plug or a bigger soft plastic or something like that. Sometimes it's just the only way to go. And a lot of times I'll I'll walk away from a big school of feeding stripers after having not caught a single one and just realize like, all right, it's not going to happen. You can go back to that area a lot of times after it gets dark, the worms disappear, the stripers are still around and all of a sudden they don't have food to feed on. A lot of times an area where there's a worm spawn will fish really well after dark on more traditional lures. Yeah. And if you're spin fishing, like I tend to be when you find one of these things, uh, a, a weightless four inch sluggo and in pink or red seems to be the the go-to for a lot of guys that are fishing, spinning, uh, you know, trying to catch uh, stripers feeding on a worm hatch. But like Kevin said, you can go back after dark when these worm, when the spawn slows down and there's not as much bait in the water, the bass are still there and they're going to be much more, uh, you're going to have a lot, lot less competition for your lures than you would when the, uh, the actual spawn was happening. These bristle worms, this type of worms, you have these, these spawning events all up and down the East Coast. There's actually a big one in Florida, in the Florida Keys. That's the Palela worm hatch. And I was just talking to a guide. I was in Florida last week and talking to him about them because I knew the worm hatches were happening up here in the Northeast and asked him about them. He said, oh, he looks forward to them all year because tarpon go crazy when, uh, when those worms, when they have that Palela worm hatch down there. And I said, oh, are they really picky? Like our stripers are. He said, no, it's the opposite. He said, when they, uh, when they get on the worms, just you throw anything at them and they'll eat it. Yeah, I got to imagine the difference is, you you know, an 18-inch schoolie striper um, is going to fill up pretty quickly eating these worm bits, whereas a big tarpon like that, I mean, a 100-pound plus fish, they've got to just, you know, take take advantage of the food source and eat fast and not think about it. So, yeah, and they're I can probably see eating that. a lot of the, They're probably eating a lot of the things that are also eating the worms, too. Right. And that's also, I mean, the, so that typically the, the striped bass you find on these worm hatches, you're up inside an estuary, they tend to be kind of the schoolie sized fish. Um, not always, occasionally there's some slightly bigger fish, but you will find bigger striped bass, you know, fish over 24 inches. They'll be in the area a lot of times and maybe not necessarily feeding on the worms, but like you mentioned, feeding on the things that are feeding on the worms. So even river herring, which would, you know, come up the, the rivers in the springtime to spawn, Typically, river herring don't feed. They're only thinking about spawning, but they will actually take advantage of these worm spawns and they will, you know, it's been been documented by scientists. They will actually take these in and eat these worms. Um, you know, and we've actually caught river herring in the middle of the worm hatch where they'll hit a fly. So long story short, you can get into some of these areas and it's, you know, if there's a worm hatch going on, you're not catching schoolies. Maybe you throw something bigger, throw a streamer, throw a minnow plug, and you might actually find there's some bigger stripers hanging around there as well. You're not likely to get your biggest striper of the season on a worm hatch, but it is a cool and kind of unique way to catch some fish. You know, you're sight fishing two of them. It's very visual and it only happens for a couple weeks a year. So it's, it's something that's a reason a lot of guys go and take advantage of it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's another part of the striper season. And like you said, there's so many different ways you can catch striped bass. There's so many different ways you start your season and move through it. This is kind of a cool period. It's definitely something which worth, worth looking for and worth checking out, seeing if you can pull some stripers out of a worm hatch. Um, and pretty soon it'll be over and we'll move on to other kinds of fishing. Exactly. And I can't wait for that. But for now, I think this, we've got a nice sunny afternoon today. We're recording this on Thursday, May 13th, and it looks like it's going to be a good day for a possible worm hatch after work. So, you know, maybe we'll get out there and see if we can, uh, get some ourselves. Yeah. We got a slack low tide late afternoon, early evening here. So it should give those backwaters a chance to warm up without a lot of water over that mud. Um, everything's lining up. So hopefully we'll get out there. Maybe we'll get some video that we can add to this of, uh, of what these worm <laughs> look like when they're flying around the surface of the water. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs>